be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Lord Jesus, make us worthy to celebrate the exaltation of your glorious cross with sacred hymns and with songs. When you appear on the last day, and the sign of your cross will shine brighter than the sun, gather us before you, and surround us with your eternal light, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever. Amen. Peace be with the church and her children. Let us raise glory, honor, and praise to the Savior who made the wood of his cross a strong fortress for his flock and established it as a sign of the covenant for the salvation of his inheritance. By his cross he exalted his church and gave joy to all people who believed in it. To the good one be glory and honor on this feast and all the days of our lives and forever. Amen. O Christ our God, by your precious cross you have given us perf perfection and made us worthy to celebrate the feast with hymns of praise proclaiming. Blessed are you, O wood of the holy cross, for you have erased Adam's curse and have restored his banished children to their inheritance. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you have united heavenly and earthly beings. Blessed are you, O holy cross, for you fulfill the words of the prophets, enlighten the apostles in their preaching, crown the martyrs for their faith, and honor the confessors for their loyalty. Now, O Christ, our Savior, we ask you with the fragrance of this incense to make the celebration of the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross a sign of security and peace. By your cross, exalt your holy church, guide her shepherds, adore her priests with virtue, purify her deacons. Help the elderly, educate children, direct the young, protect orphans, care for widows, and grant rest in your dwellings of light to our brothers and sisters who have died hoping in you. May we find refuge in the shadow of your cross on the great day of your second coming, so that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your Father and to your Holy Spirit forever.
Jesus Christ, our Lord, accept the prayers and the fragrance of the incense that we have offered on the feast of the exaltation of your holy cross. May its sign always be visible before our eyes to strengthen us, that we may walk with you toward death and then stand at your right hand to celebrate the feast of your eternal victory. We glorify you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. <coughs> of St. Paul to the Philippians. Glory to the Lord of Paul and the Apostles. May the mercy of God descend upon the reader, the listeners, and upon this parish, your children, forever. So then, my beloved, obedient as you have always been, not only when I am present, but now all the more so when I am absent. Work out your salvation with fear and with trembling. For God is the one who, for his own good purpose, works in you both the desire and the work. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may be blameless and innocent children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine like lights in the world, as you hold on to the word of life, so that my boast on the day of Christ may be that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. But even if I am poured out as a libation upon the sacrificial service of your faith, I rejoice, and I share my joy with all of you. 
In like manner, you also should rejoice and share your joy with me. Praise be to God always. Before the proclamation of the gospel of our Saviour announcing life for our souls, we offer this incense and ask for your mercy, O Lord. From the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Saint Matthew, who proclaimed life unto the world, let us listen to the proclamation of life and salvation for our souls. <coughs> the Lord Jesus says, and then the kingdom of heaven shall be likened to ten bridesmaids who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were foolish and five were wise. The foolish ones, when taking their lamps, brought no oil with them. But the wise brought flasks of oil along with their lamps. Since the bridegroom was long delayed, they all became drowsy and fell asleep. At midnight there was a cry, Behold the bridegroom, come forth to meet him. Then all those bridesmaids got up and trimmed their lamps. And the foolish ones said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. But the wise ones replied, No, for there may not be enough for us and for you. Go instead to the merchants and buy some for yourselves. And while they went off to buy this, the bridegroom arrived, and those who were ready went into the wedding feast with him. Then the doors were locked. Afterwards, the other bridesmaids returned, and they said, Lord, Lord, open the door for us. But he said in reply, Amen, I say to you, I do not know you. Therefore, remain vigilant, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is the truth, peace be with you. Whatever you do, 
do without murmuring or arguing. In the name of the Father, of the Son, of the Holy Spirit, amen. At the end of the first century, St. Clement of Rome, who was a succession to St. Peter in that first century as the Bishop of Rome, he wrote that it is through him, through our Lord, that the eyes of our hearts are opened. Now, it sounds very poetic, but what it actually winds up meaning is God looks first at us, and our response to him is to be able to see. And so God, through our Lord, opens the eyes of the heart. And remember, in the Semitic notion, the heart is the person, the very core of the being of the person. So it's through Christ that our eyes of our hearts are open. God looks at us, if you want the theological technical term we use, called prevenient grace. Prevenience means coming beforehand. And God first is always in our lives before we're ever aware of it. And in the process of conversion, there is that duh moment, when all of a sudden we realize, duh, what have I been doing with my life? And we realize all the things that our Lord has been doing beforehand to get us to see. So it's through him that our eyes, the eyes of the heart are opened. And this is something that Saint Paul to the Philippians is both praising and encouraging to the Philippians. Remember the parish at Philippi was the group of people that were some of the closest to St. Paul. St. Paul, of course, loves in the way of charity. He loves all the churches and all the people. He works for them. But at the level of affection, it's clearly at this church of the Philippi, these people really loved him and he really loved them. There was an affection that was shared. And so he's praising them for what they do. You've been obedient when I'm present. You listen. Obedience, again, just means listening. You listen when I'm present, but even now more so that I'm gone, you're even still doing this. And he says at the end of this section, he says, because in the middle he's encouraging them. We'll come back to that in a moment. But at the end, he's encouraging them to say that even if my life is being poured out as a sacrifice, as a libation, on the altar of your faith, in other words, the things that I do that you're not even aware of, that are going to cost me in this sacrificial giving, that's fine. Because on the day of Christ, on the day of judgment, I will be able to say that in your case, I have not run in vain. The teaching I brought to you, the divine mysteries I brought to you, you've responded to. And the eyes of your hearts have been opened. And therefore, in that response, even though it will cost me everything, it has not been in vain. So he's praising them in the middle and at the end, which is why he says that you work out your salvation in fear and trembling. It's a very famous verse. Though unfortunately, a lot of people who read it, read it as being, reading fear and trembling as being terror and horror, which is not what the verse actually means. Trembling and fear means to stand overwhelmed by the awe before the divine majesty who has touched our hearts to open those eyes. And we know that that's the meaning behind it because the first part of this chapter is about what Christ has done for us. And I encourage you to go back and read the whole chapter because he says at the very beginning of the chapter, I wish that you have the same mind that Christ had within him. That while being God, he set aside everything that was due to him in his glory, in his majesty, in his divinity and emptied himself, the famous Greek kenosis, emptied himself and became man in the form of a slave, in poverty, in humility, entering into a fallen world, though he himself, of course, without sin, and to stand before the Holy One who became man like us so that we may see and live. And he says, when you understand that mystery, then the mind of Christ is to replicate. We can't say replicate, you can't replicate it, but you can imitate it, each in your own place. And so that's why he says you work out your healing. 
You work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You stand in awe before the majesty of the Holy One who has appeared among us in time. You know, last week in the bulletin, I wrote up the long, long section on how we use our time and what we do. Life is short. Our days are brief. We all only have our mechanically measured 24 hours in a day. And life will finish. And on the day of judgment, we're going to be asked, what did you do with those millions of seconds I gave to you? A prayer can be in a second. Charitable actions can be in a minute. And he will ask us, what have you done? And when we stand there and say, oh, I spent millions of hours surfing the web, this is not going to look good. This is not in awe and respect before the majestic one. This is not the mind of Christ. And that's what St. Paul is reminding the Philippians, because he loves them, and because there is this extra affection, he says, you have to understand who you are and the great ability that God has given you. But you have to begin by standing before awe and majesty. I have lamented about this in the last weeks. Because now that apparently we've gone through, we always have crises. That's just the way the world's going to be forever. One catastrophe will just follow another. And if there isn't one, they'll make up one because it's a good way to govern. Terrorize everyone and make them be obedient. All right, this is a problem of politics. But when there was, in those first years of 2020 and 2021, when we think about how we used our time when the doors of the stores closed, but the church was open, how we used our time, and now when the doors are open to so many other things that we can do, we go to those things, and the house of God is left at a second or a third choice in tier. St. Paul, when he says to work out our salvation with fear and trembling, is to say we stand before the majesty of God and understand what God has done to set aside everything, as it were, for our sake, the very creatures that he made. And so in the long bulletin, I mentioned last week, we stop periodically around the altar to participate in the life of the Holy Trinity. This is something we have to always tell ourselves again and again as Catholics, because we live at best in a Protestant culture. In a Protestant culture, Protestants, the Sunday services are prayer services, and there's nothing wrong with that. But they're just prayer services, and you can pray at home. So it's logical, I pray at home or I pray with a bunch of people. But that is not the Catholic vision. The Catholic vision is the divine mysteries that become present among us are the very reality of Christ who emptied himself to be present. And on those feast days and on those Sundays, we participate around the altar and in the divine mysteries and the sacrament of penance, the baptisms of our children. All of these divine mysteries are there for us to participate within the life of the Holy Trinity. It's not just a prayer service. It is a moment that we stop and God is able to touch us so that our eyes be opened in the very substantial reality of what those mysteries are. That's why just before we left the, the sacristy this morning with the boys, before we bowed to the crucifix, I said, so let us prepare ourselves now to enter into the Holy Trinity. That is the divine mysteries. It's not a prayer service. It is the divine mysteries from which prayers flow forth. But that's a different vision. And St. Paul is reminding us when we live in fear and trembling to work out our salvation, he's reminding us, because he immediately says, because it's God who is at work within you. God has given you this desire for what is more noble, for what is more holy, that what is virtuous, it's why it's not a question of just simply, what do I have to do? It's a question of what is the better thing? What is more beautiful? What is more virtuous? What is more honorable? What is more noble? This is not a vocabulary that the world uses these days. 
Everything by the 70s onward was reduced to the least common denominator, and now we're just degraded beyond that to pure mediocrity. That is not the vision of Christ. God emptied himself of everything possible to him in order to raise us up back to him. Read the whole chapter two of the Philippians. What is more virtuous? What is better? What is more noble? What is more honorable? And so that even when the doors of more entertaining things are open to us, the Lord Jesus is still first in those choices. And not because the doors of the stores are open, we wander off to those things or whatever it may be. It's a bit like I've told you before of the one man who told me back in the 80s. And he talked about his older parents when they would get their paychecks. And they lived, they were just working class, they lived poor, they lived paycheck to paycheck. But he said that his father would always take this paycheck. And the thing is, he began to calculate all the bills he had to pay. And he would take the check, and the very first calculation was the tithe, the 10% that was taken off of what God had given him in his labors. Then he proceeded to pay the rest of the bills. I put that in the bulletin because a few weeks ago we had this conversation. Well, is my tithe, is this 10%, is this based upon my gross or my net? Well, did the Lord God give you your net or give you your gross? He gave you the gross of everything we have, our talents, our intelligence, our jobs, our well-being. The place that we were born into so that we can have the ability to breathe and prosper. That is why it was such an edifying story. It's remained with me for well over 30 years to think about a poor man sitting down and returning to God that tenth and then with the other nine parts paying the rest of the things that are needed in this world. Not calculating, net and gross. That would be the equivalent of the man who had a flock in which three of his lambs were sick and decided you don't get back the other 10 lambs. You don't get back the sacrifices because three of them are sick. This is a calculation that is not in chapter two of the Philippians. What is more virtual? What is more virtuous? What is more noble? What is more honorable? What is the better path? So that our lives being poured out as sacrificial libations, as St. Paul talks about his own, we can stand on the day of Christ and say, I did what I could. Instead of saying, I calculated really precisely and gave you back the part that was the least painful to me. That doesn't make any sense. It is not the mind of God, a God who depletes himself of everything and becomes man in the form of a slave. And so St. Paul says, when you live this way in the fear and trembling, and God is working this within you, both the desire for this more beautiful and more virtuous thing and the ability to accomplishment. That we can never forget. This is God's work, not ours. But we have to respond to it, otherwise nothing happens in our life. Many people surrounding our Lord, as our Lord walks through the Gospels and you read it, you see our Lord's appearances. He teaches, he corrects, he heals. The, line, the lame walk, the blind see, the dead rise, these responses that come, these are the opening of the eyes of the heart. And so that our Lord's entrance into the world brings that beauty of healing and salvation. But it also provokes those who are calculating, who look out for number one, and who will rise up, as you know the story so well, who will rise up and put him to death on Calvary. Same human beings, same human minds, same human spirits, same free will. Why is the response so different? Well, it depends on whether we see or don't see. This is why St. Paul goes on in this section of the letter to the Philippians to say, this is why when you live for what is more virtuous, what is more holy, instead of calculating, then you are lights in a dark generation that is perverse. He says, this is why you shine as lights in a crooked and perverse generation. It's a very beautiful image of what the Christian life is meant to be. 
But the problem in our lives, again, we live in a culture which is all about comfort. Now the word comfort, historically, the middle word and the, the, the root word in it is fortis. Fortis in Latin means strength. This word, comfort, was originally the idea of strengthening someone to do what they need to do. We have slightly that image still left, someone who's in mourning. We comfort them so they can get back on their feet and live. But comfort is not the, usually the way we use that word. That's the older version. Comfort now means physical ease, sensual satisfaction. And that comfort is a disaster because it's all about me. It's all about what's in it for me. And so comfort now becomes a horizontal vision of what is the physical ease and sensual satisfaction to the individual. That's why we buy stuff all the time. We have more junk in our houses than we need possibly for three lifetimes, let alone for this one. We know this. And we've talked about the fact, and in America, how we could develop the fact that you can just build empty garages for storage space and make a business out of it because we have so much junk. But we have that junk because we succumb to the modern world's vision of comfort, of physical ease, of satisfying the senses, and there's nothing wrong with being in that sense comfortable. But when it becomes the very foundation by which we judge everything in our lives, this is a catastrophe. Because it locks everything down into the horizontal and locks everything down into this world and about the individual. That is why St. Paul says that this generation is crooked and perverse. He's not saying historically they were more perverse 2,000 years ago. It just means that is what human nature is when left on its own. But thanks be to God that the Lord God himself has walked among us in order to allow us to open the eyes of the heart and to be able to see what is more noble, what is more virtuous, what is better, and to gear our lives around that. God bless that man who lived in poverty who still had the intelligence, it isn't even a mystery, to say that God has given me everything in my life and I return that tithe, that 10% to him because he is good. Not because it's easy for me, not because it brings me comfort, but because it is to stand in awe and trembling working out my healing and the healing of my family. Remember, this is a man who's in his 80s telling me the story in the 1980s. He's talking about a father who had been born in the 19th century in a world which was very different in the way they prioritized the things in their lives. Not because they were better, but their principles in the way they lived were better. Doesn't mean they always lived up to them but they saw the world in a different way. It is again and again the story that I tell you when those Colby kids came and they marveled at how this building could be put up by illiterate and impoverished Lebanese, Syrian, Ottoman immigrants, how they could build this when they themselves were poor. It is priorities. It is the fear and trembling to work out our salvation. It's a very beautiful text. In fact, this has always been one of my most favorite texts because though it is austere and demanding, this is hard. This is hard that every choice in my life should be what is the better thing to do. Yesterday, we celebrated the Feast of St. Teresa of Avila. Her spiritual director gave her the authorization to make a vow that in every choice she would choose the better thing, a vow as an act of religion that throughout her life, every time she was presented with a choice, which is like continually, is it not, that she had vowed herself to always choose the better thing. This is why she becomes a mystic. This is why she is Saint Teresa. 
We are meant to imitate that same vision of choosing what is more virtuous and what is more holy and what is the better choice, not what is the comfortable choice. And when we do that, then we become those lights that shine in a perverse and crooked generation. You don't have to do anything different. You don't have to organize a world apostolate to bring souls to Christ. You just have to live chapter 2 of the letter to the Philippians. It is not that we have to do gimmicks or advertising. Advertising is what gave us the world of comfort. The 19th century Victorians, reading while drinking cocaine or taking laudanum is so good for your life. All right, so they become addicts in many cases in their, in their cocaine and opium addictions in the 19th century, a different version of it. But those advertising, why you need to buy this, why you need to do that, why you need to go here, why you need to buy life insurance, you're still going to die, but pay us money. These visions are what brought a world of comfort and the idea of a security which was falsified. Which is why if you remember the gospel last week, our Lord says that at the very moment they say everything's great, peace, security, we've got it set, my 401k is really cranking it up now. Not like this last year, but now it's just really moving forward. When they say peace and security, then destruction will fall upon them, as our Lord describes the day of judgment. What is more virtuous? What is better? We change the way that we live, and the people of Maine will see that. They will see that we choose virtue first. But of course, what is our temptation? Our temptation is to live like they do, but just a little bit better. You know, maybe not so many marriages. Maybe not, you know, well, maybe we don't do abortions. You know, and, occasion, and we say the rosary. That is not the vision of St. Paul. That is not working out a healing in fear and trembling. So while as this chapter is one of the most beautiful chapters of the New Testament, it is profoundly scathing. It is profoundly austere. It burns. Because it means that every moment of our life has to be transformed as Christ in his incarnation was transformed in order that to raise us up, we also must follow that ascent by following his descent in the incarnation. So read this chapter. Meditate on it. Consider it during this week. And then ask for that strength that after all, if God is the one who brought you to these pews this morning, if God truly is the one who is at work within you to provoke the desire and to accomplish this work within you, you have the right to demand a greater strength. St. Philip Neri used to pray daily, keep your hand upon your servant Philip, Lord, lest he turn Turk on you. In other words, in the 16th century, the Turks were the ones always invading Europe, constantly fighting Europe. The Muslims were constantly fighting. We forget about that. But it became the great sign of infidelity. Keep your hand upon your servant Lord, Philip, James, Rebecca, whatever the name may be. Keep your hand on me, Lord, otherwise I have the complete possibility of betraying you. And when we pray like that to the God who works within us the desire, we're also praying for him to accomplish this transformation within us. That is fear and trembling. Do that and you will be brilliant lights, guaranteed, in this generation immediately. In the name of the Father, of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen.
believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all things visible and invisible. We believe in the one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, born of the Father before all ages, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, the God of God. Through him all things were made. From sin for our salvation, he came down from heaven. And by the Holy Spirit was the incarnate of the Virgin Mary and became man. For our sake he was crucified in the conscious child. He suffered death and was buried, and rose again on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven, and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is the glory and glory of life, who has spoken to the cross. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism for the forgiveness of sin. upon them, and in place of their earthly gifts, grant them life and your imperishable kingdom. Amen. As we remember our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and his plan of salvation for us, we recall upon this offering all those who have pleased God from Adam to this day. Especially Mary, the Blessed Mother of God, Saint Joseph, her spouse, Sappholi, Father, Saint Mary, Saint Jude, and Saint Longinus. Remember, O God, the children of the Holy Church, our fathers and mothers, and our brothers and sisters, both the living and the departed, especially those for whom this sacrifice is offered for the repose of Catherine Hawes. Remember also all those who share with us today in this offering. Amen. 
Here it is. Alleluia. Continue with the Anapha of the Twelve Apostles on page 754. 754. <clears throat> Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Merciful and holy Lord and Father, through your only begotten Son, you have prepared this spiritual banquet for us. Accept the offering of this bloodless sacrifice and grant us the gift of your Holy Spirit. Make us worthy to give one another the greeting of peace with pure hearts and divine love, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, to your only Son and to your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <clears throat> peace to you, O holy altar of God. Peace to the holy mysteries placed upon you. Peace to you, O server of the Holy Spirit. Let us give the greeting of peace to our neighbor with love and faith that are pleasing to God. and security and your true love and divine mercy be with us and among us all the days of our lives that we may raise glory and thanks to you now and forever Amen. O Lord we bow before you and ask you to look upon us with mercy make us worthy to approach your holy altar with pure hearts and holy souls and bodies, that we may raise glory and thanks to you, now and forever. Amen. The love of God the Father and the grace of the only begotten Son and the communion and indwelling of the Holy Spirit be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. Lift up our thoughts, our minds, and our hearts. We give them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord with reverence and worship Him with humility. It is right and 
truly it is right and just to glorify and praise you, O God the Father, for you are holy and the giver of life. You are blessed with your only begotten Son and your living Holy Spirit. You are surrounded by the cherubim and seraphim who sing with pure voices and heavenly melodies. They cry out, glorify and proclaim. church implores you and through you and with you implores your father saying O oh Lord as we your sinful children receive your graces we thank you for them and because of them I 
May these holy mysteries be for the forgiveness of sins, the healing of souls and bodies, and the strengthening of consciences so that none of your faithful may perish. Rather, make us worthy to live by your Spirit and to lead a pure life. And we raise glory to you now and forever. Amen. We offer you, O Lord, this divine sacrifice for your church, especially for our fathers and shepherds, Francis, the Pope of Rome, Bashar Peter, our Patriarch of Antioch, Gregory John, our Bishop, and all the bishops of the true faith, with blameless lives and with purity and holiness, May they guide your church and present to you a faithful people who honor your name. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, your people here before you, especially those who have presented these offerings. Forgive them so that they may always live blameless lives in your presence and recognize the blessings that you bestow upon them. For you are good and rich in graces. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, civil leaders throughout the world, that they may stand for justice and establish peace. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, all those who have pleased you from the beginning, especially Mary, the Holy Mother of God, and the prophets, apostles, martyrs, and confessors, John the Baptist, Stephen the Archdeacon, St. Joseph, St. Jude, and St. Longinus, assist us through their prayers and make us worthy to rejoice with them in your kingdom. We pray to you, O Lord. Remember, O Lord, the fathers and teachers of the true faith who have endured sufferings for the sake of your church and your people. May we truly and faithfully follow in their footsteps. We pray to you, O Lord. Lord, have mercy. Remember, O Lord, the faithful departed who have left us and have gone to their rest hoping in you awaiting that life-giving voice, calling them to life. Accept the offerings we present to you on their behalf, and have mercy on them in your kingdom. Through our Lord Jesus, who is without sin, we hope to find mercy and forgiveness for our sins and for theirs. Pardon, O God, and forgive us and the departed, so that your blessed name may be glorified in us and in all things. With the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and of your living Holy Spirit, now and forever.
O Lord, you are the pleasing oblation. You offer yourself to us. You are the forgiving sacrifice. You offer yourself to the Father. You are the high priest. You offer yourself as the man. Through your mercy, may our prayer rise like incense, which we offer to your Father through you. To you, to you be glory. Compassionate Lord, may we, your lowly servants, be made worthy to pray with purity and holiness and to call upon you, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory of God. Yes, O Lord, lover of all people, deliver us from the evil one and from his deceitful ways. And do not forsake us, lest temptation overcome us, for yours is the kingdom. With your only Son and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Shlomo el O Lord, bless your faithful people who bow before you. Deliver us from all harm and make us worthy to share in these divine mysteries of purity and holiness, that through them we may be forgiven and be made holy, and we raise glory to you now and forever. The grace of the Most Holy Trinity eternal and consubstantial, be with you, my brothers and sisters, forever. And holy gifts for the holy with perfection, purity, and sanctity. One holy Father, one holy Son, one holy Spirit, blessed be the name of the Lord, for he is one in heaven and on earth, to him be glory. Make us worthy, O Lord God, so that our bodies be sanctified by your holy body, and our souls purified by your forgiving blood. May our communion be for the forgiveness of our sins and for new life. O Lord our God, to you be glory forever.
again and again. We thank you, O Lord, and we raise glory to you for giving us your body to eat and your living blood to drink. O lover of all people, have mercy on us.
We thank you, Lord God and Father, and we ask that this divine communion be for the forgiveness of sins and for the glory of your holy name and that of your only Son and of your Holy Spirit, now and forever. <coughs> Shlomo Elokolchunna. Lord Jesus, our God and Savior, you became flesh for our sake, and by sacrificing yourself, you saved us. Deliver us from damnation, and make us temples of your holy name, for we are your people and your inheritance. We glorify and honor you, your Father, and your Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Go in peace, my beloved brothers and sisters, with the nourishment and blessings you have received from the forgiving altar of the Lord. May the blessing of the Most Holy Trinity accompany you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the one God, to whom be glory forever. <clears throat>